plenty of extra chairs up here. There's this whole front row. We <laughs> <laughs> could take that and move it back. And we have second row. Don't step behind you and you won't be able to see. This, we're we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is going to be with a PowerPoint. That's why I rearranged. We were kind of set up a little bit differently, but I would like to work off of my computer as opposed to just simply working off of this because I don't get any prompts or notes or other things that go along with PowerPoint. And today, we're going to basically try to get through just eight slides on PowerPoint. I need PowerPoint to keep me moving and not going off on too many tangents, which is quite easy to do. And so to kind of keep this somewhat structured and organized. start today a 12-week series on <coughs> church history. Now by church, we're basically we're talking about Christianity, Christian church. Uh, so it's the history of Christianity, it's doctrine, you know, that's the things it believes, uh, and those kind of vary. Uh, it's organizational structure, it's ecclesiology, that's the academic terminology for church organization, ecclesiology, the evolution, which is simply the change over time, and things change over time. We are not the church that existed in many ways uh, on the day of Pentecost, when they had all things in common. Uh, we have a lot in common, but I don't think we have all things. So there's been quite a bit of change in the church over time. Um, and so this, the church, when we get to church history, to some extent it actually well predates Christ. We have all these events that occur leading up to Christ. And so it's a history of before Christ to the present day. And that is an extremely broad undertaking. And there is no way to cover that in great depth in 12 weeks. In fact, you can't cover that in great depth in two years. Um, or even a lifetime. So we're going to kind of do a broad overview. And then we will do some selected expansion where we will get a little bit deeper in some areas. And so this is going to be week one today. And it's going to be an introduction. And we will start by saying, well, wait a second, we're talking about history of Christianity, the history of the church. Well, just what is history? Well, simply put, most of us would start thinking, well, history is a study of the past. But it's more than that because it's almost always undertaken with the intent of trying to understand not just the past, but oftentimes even the present. Why things occur? Why are we the way we are today? How did we come to believe what we believe, to do what we do? So history is often undertaken with an attempt to try to understand, make sense of the present. Now, I came across an article on history that kind of posed this question, what is history? There was a, fam a fairly significant book for historians written by a guy named Carr back in 1961. And the title of that book was What is History? And it's a book that's still widely used uh, in a lot of curriculum for history students. And so they posed that question this past year to four historians to get their responses. And basically the four responses were history is the study of people 
actions, decisions, interactions, and behaviors. And this particular person went on to expand this within his little article. And I thought this was insightful. History's primary purpose is to stand at the center of diverse, tolerant, intellectually rigorous debate about our existence, our political systems, leadership, society, economy, and culture. And then he notes, however, open and free debate, as in so many areas of life, is too often lacking, and it is not difficult to locate the cause of this intolerance. And we certainly have seen a great deal of intolerance lately over the last few years when it comes to having open discussion. And those who scream the loudest are attempting to shut that down. And that really makes it very difficult to look into things. Another historian said that he, I, have a preference for historians who probe into the why and the how. In other words, their intent when they are looking into history is to try to understand why and how. History is fundamentally a problem-solving discipline. And finally, histories are useful for telling us how we got here. Now, there is no such thing as an objective historian who is unfettered from all current assumptions. Everyone has an agenda. You have agendas you don't even know. And, and those influence the way you interpret the past. Every history is an interpretation. It's a never-ending dialogue between the past and the present with a view toward the future. This was a quote from uh, Gonzales in a book that uh, is somewhat of a source book for this called Christian Thought Revisited. Now, we said, well, what is history? Well, we're talking about the history of the church, the history of Christianity, so that brings up the next question. And that question is, well, what is church? Or what is the church? But just my first take on that, the McClure definition, and I like to use a lot of slashes and things like that so I can get it all confused and jumbled up, and it's, it is somewhat variously. Now, if there are misspellings on here, it's because my wife did not get to proof these two <laughs> couple of these slides here. Yeah, I threw a couple other things in this morning. So, so if there's some misspellings there, you know, that's, that's why. Okay, somewhat variously organized group or groups of people worshiping God, usually at a specific or common location, or locations. You know, in our present day and age, with uh, internet, video capability, we can make an argument that we're having an assembly, a church, when people are in all kinds of different places. But we are doing it at the same time. So, it's, and that is somewhat organized. Now, of course, you can always go to the sources for a definition. So what is church? Well, if you go to Marion Webster, typically a lot of people think of church as a building. A building for public and especially Christian worship. And Christian really is incorporated with church. If you want to talk about Jewish worship, we typically talk about what? We talk about synagogue or temple. Um, Muslim, we don't talk about church, we talk about they, they go to the temple, right? Mosque, mosque. mosque excuse me, mosque. So, so the word church actually incorporates Christianity. It's also, from a just dictionary definition, it's uh, the, the organizational structure, the hierarchy, the, the clergy, the officials of a religious body. Um, the word is often capitalized, we'll get into that in a little bit as a body or organization of a religious believer, such as 
uh, the Presbyterian Church, denomination, congregations, uh, a public worship, a clerical profession. And, <coughs> at the risk of sounding dumber than I normally do, is this definition kind of a predicate into your class, or are we willing to discuss it? Is this really what the church is? Well, that that's kind of another topic to some extent. Some of that would come in. And where we go is a little bit open-ended because I don't have this all mapped out. I've got a lot of it mapped out, but I don't have it all finalized to any extent whatsoever. But if we look a little bit deeper into church, church biblically, New Testament, comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which simply means people, a symbol. And that word basically changed its meaning with the advent of Christianity. Uh, they started calling themselves Ecclesia, and so it comes to then mean Christian assemblies. But originally it just meant people assemble. That's what Ecclesia means. Now the word actually church comes from the Old English, which comes from the Greek, but not Ecclesia. It comes from the Greek uh, Doma, and Doma is a house. And, and the, the church part, that's the, the C and the R and the C, or the CH, the R and the C. You will find that words, if you do any study, preserve their consonants as they change. The things that change with words are the vowels. And they move from one language to another or evolve even within the same language through alteration of their vowels. And so within church, we basically have Christ. And you can trace that etymology back, and that's where those letters come from. It is, it is the house of the Lord, the kurios. It's the kurikalon. And that's where we get, so church is Christ. So it carries that connotation. So now then, the next question would be, and I think this is something that, Jeff was kind of hinting at, you know, we're talking about, well, Rook is actually church. Well, then we have this big issue about, well, like, what is Christianity? Because we're going to talk about the history of Christianity. And we're going to be somewhat limited in that discussion, and we're going to kind of go down uh, a relatively narrow path. But there's all kinds of branches out there, depending on how broad you want to throw that definition. So I said, well, okay, what's the McClure definition of Christianity? Well, it's a religion or religious belief system in which, I'm sure this is really broad, in which Christ is essential, necessary, important. So now that you go, go to the sources, let's go see what the internet and the dictionaries say, right? Well, one good little quote, and I thought this was okay, I thought this was pretty good. It's the faith tradition that focuses on the figure of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a very broad definition, and we're going to get a lot more specific than that because we're going to try, because we're going to ultimately land or try to land with the history that leads to us. Us specifically assembled here in the Graymere Church of Christ. We're looking to get to the history of the Church of Christ, us. Where did we come from? How did we get here? And this, so when we talk about Christianity, and maybe even when we talk about church, it kind of leads to this kind of problem with, well, what is true, and what is like uh, sort of, sort of, kind of, or to a degree. And we could argue about that until the cows come home, okay? And we won't really get anywhere. Now we can start setting out the main points, and we will be focusing on some of those really main points. And when we do a history like this, there's just all kinds of ways you can go. If you think about it, history is about places and people and times and interrelations and ideals. And when we talk about Christianity, we have these important doctrinal concepts, baptism, observance of the Lord's Supper. Each of those has a detailed history. And we could take each of those and run it all the way down. And that is one approach to it. But that's not 
We're going to do some of that. When I say we're going to go a little bit deeper in some places, we're going to do some of that. But we're going to try to do a little bit of a chronology getting down to our present day. And I'll, at the last slide, we'll get down to what our topics are going to actually be. Yeah, I hope you bring a tip jar because I'm going to throw some tips your way because I'm hoping that we look at, not exclusively, but Christianity as being discipleship of Jesus and the churches where disciples are made. And potentially maybe how we vary from that. Well, maybe we'll get to that toward the end. Yeah, okay. Because you know, maybe some, some, job, some, some, right? some of some of that is some of that is maybe not quite history. Yes, it is history. Okay, but we'll, but we'll get to some of that. So now sources. Have to have sources, right? Well, the first source is me, and that's that anything but unfeathered objective historian. Now. <laughs> Some of you, most of you may know, some of you may not know that I'm a medical doctor. That's that MD. But I had this midlife crisis, okay? This midlife crisis. You know, midlife crisis, all kinds of things can happen. You know, some guys, you know, they upgrade wives. <laughs> I don't know if that's really an upgrade or not, but, you know, they, they change wives. In fact, some of them several times, you know, they have a bunch of midlife crises. Uh, get a fast car, a sports car, get a motorcycle, something like that. You know, there, there's all kinds of midlife crises. Well, my midlife crisis was kind of intellectual. So I decided to go back to school. And so from 2008 to 2016, over eight years, I got my Master's of Divinity from Lipscomb University. So I go through school the first time, back in the 70s and the 80s, and really, that's a period of time when, okay, I was doing hardcore science. Of course, I did go to Lipscomb University, so Bible class every day, chapel every day, um, and a moderate interest in religion. So I go through that period of time, and that's really a lot more modernistic, a modernistic period. We can, we can spend a lot of time talking about modernism, postmodernism. And I go back to school, and when I go back to school, we definitely are no longer in a modern period. We are definitely in a postmodern period. Um, and so I have that kind of unique exposure from both sides. But I had that midlife crisis, and I spent a lot of time studying things, especially history and history of the church. So there are multiple sources of influences. Look, I am, I'm a fourth, maybe even fifth generation member of the Church of Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, my father was. My grandfather was. My great grandfather was. And, oh, you can branch off to grandmothers too. So I have lots. I've been steeped in the Church of Christ. Born and raised in the Church of Christ. And still here. And plan on staying. Now, other sources that I'm going to use that I think are quite significant. I already mentioned Gonzalez. He has a, a, a book that's it's a, it's a worthwhile read, I think, for anyone called Christian Thought Revisited. It was revised in 1999. I think it was first published in 1989. And, and we'll get into some of that. He looks at theology, Christian theology, and sees three broad types that date back into the first and second century that have carried forward to today. And most people are not just one type, they're a, they're a mixture, but, but it's a pretty insightful way of looking at things. Um, and then he has a significant work in three volumes, it's about 1,200 pages, um, of a history of Christian thought. The first volume is from the beginning to the Council of uh, Chalcedon, which was in 451 A.D., and during this period of time, the big focus, the big focus was Christological controversies. In other words, trying to get a handle, theologically, on Christ and how Christ relates, related to God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we take a lot of that for granted. 
but we are greatly dependent upon the thought processes that occur during this period of time on our present view of Christ and Trinitarian theology. The second volume of his book is from Augustine, and he kind of backs up a little bit there, to the eve of the Reformation. By eve, he means the beginning, just before it started, not after. Which, the eve of the Reformation is about 1500. So from about 400 to 1500. Now, Augustine is a significant figure in Christianity. There's no way to really discuss Christianity and a history without mentioning Augustine, who was born in three... 54, he was converted from Manichaeanism <coughs> to Christianity in 387, baptized as a believing adult, he may have even been immersed, became a priest in 391 and died in 430. And we are quite dependent on Augustine for a lot of things that we are for and a lot of things that we are against. He becomes a lightning rod in many ways. This whole period that this book deals with is this medieval period, the Middle Ages. It's a thousand years that most of everyone is completely ignorant of. And then, the final volume is from the Protestant Reformation to the 20th century. Now, when we do the Protestant Reformation, and talk about that to some extent, some of my source information is a relatively new book written in 2016 on reformations the early modern world, dealing with from 1450 to uh, 1650. And then when we get into the Stone Campbell movement, I have all kinds of sources for that. But one that is quite significant and easily accessible is called the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement and that was published in 2004. Now, let's see where we're at. Okay. What is the history that most of us, or a lot of us, have already in mind? What have we already been taught? What have we already come to believe? And this is, this is totally me putting this stuff down. And this is small print. But the Church of Christ was established in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, which is around 30 A.D. Some people say 33, but when you really get right down to it, Jesus was almost certainly born 4, 3 B.C. and not 0 A.D. Under the leadership of the apostles, and those that they appointed, the church grew and spread, that was greatly aided by persecution. You know, persecution winds up being the unintended consequences of simplistic solutions to complex problems. And so you're trying to stamp out a group of people, and so you persecute them, and what happens to them? They go here, and they go there, and what do they do when they go here, and when they go there? They bring their ideas with them, and instead of stamping it out, you just make it spread further. So, persecution, and then missionary efforts, and we have good examples of that in the New Testament, by Paul and Barnabas and others. This led to the rapid spread of Christianity. The New Testament, it eventually supersedes the apostles. They die. It also takes the hope, it seems to take the place of the Holy Spirit, because we no longer have direct communication. And it displaces the Old Testament. So the New Testament becomes the authoritative guide for the leaders of the church. And also members of the church. Just remember, most of those early members were pretty Ill, they were illiterate. Okay? And most congregations didn't have a New Testament text because that really didn't come into published form probably until at least the second century. Um, and uh, they were using the Old Testament as their scripture. Now, beginning in the first century, false teachings crept in. There's no doubt about that. Probably almost from the very beginning, you could say false teachings crept in. And then this leads to, and almost all non-Catholic religious groups talk about the great apostasy. 
which is the Catholic Church and the Pope. And the Catholic Church and the Pope really come into full form in about the 3rd or 4th century. And then you have this long, dark period. That's that period of time people are almost totally ignorant of. Well, wait a second. We extend that period of time to some extent. This long, dark period. And that is when uh, we're, we have a hard time recognizing something that we would call Church of Christ. And certainly you don't find anything you would call Baptist Church or Presbyterian Church or Mormon Church. And so this long, dark period, of course, we like to believe it may well be true, probably is, that maybe all the way through here there's some small remnant that are doing the right things following the New Testament teachings and being opposed to what we see as the apostasy of the Catholic Church. This is a period of time that lasting, from our personal traditional perspective, 1,700 years. That's a long time wandering in the wilderness. And just to put that into perspective, from a historical perspective, from Abraham, the first Hebrew, the, the father of Israel, the Jewish nation, the ancestor of Jesus Christ, from Abraham to Christ is 1,900 years. That's a huge swath of history. And we have this period that we call the Great Apostasy that we largely, completely ignore what actually happened during this period of time, thinking that we haven't really been influenced by that. Boom. Leading all the way up to where we are right now. Go ahead. I, I think we also think about the Catholic Church and just kind of being born exactly as it is today, the same way it was then. No, the Catholic Church has, has, has changed yeah. greatly. The Pope meant a lot. Dude. Nobody was infallible for no, it's it's a, it's a more recent move, and we're you know we we'll touch on some of that. We cannot do everything. It's just too much material in too short a time, and we're going to try to get to Church of Christ. So, beginning in the early 16th century, we had the Reformation movement. Now that leads to what Protestant denominationalism, and it very quickly led to that. That wasn't their intent, but that's what happened. That's that unintended consequences of things. But Protestant denominationalism, what you got Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, and Episcopalians. And so we don't really consider those to be true Church of Christ. So that's still a continuation of this great apostasy. But we are so strongly influenced by all of those events that to ignore those events is just to be ignorant of history. Yes. I, the only comment I want to make is uh, I don't know a lot about the institutions. And, and I know you talk about remnant. I do think that in any circumstance and instance, and even the institutional setting, there are people that can be Christians. And I think that's an important message because I think today in the Church of Christ, there are some people still maybe persist in thinking that that's not true. That if you're not going to this church, it's non-negotiable, you're going to be burning. And uh, I just think maybe we'll explore that a little bit. Yeah, we, we, I don't, we can touch on Don't that. subscribe to we that. We can touch on that. So then, then here, and this is where we really get to more of our history, which lots of people are still fairly ignorant of. In the early 19th century, 19th centuries, early 1800s, in the United States, we have a movement, a religious movement, and this is occurring on multiple fronts. It's not just church, what leads to Church of Christ. There is reforming, restoring efforts in multiple areas. This is a new country. It came into existence, you know, in the late 1700s. There's a, it's, it's a frontier experience. There is religious fervor and in the midst of that, Martin W. Stone, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, those are the four big people, but many others, basically, we could say began, they didn't know they were doing it, but were the force behind the American, what we call the American Restoration Movement. Academically, we tend to call that the Stone-Campbell movement after Martin W. Stone 
and Thomas and Alexander Campbell, mainly Alexander Campbell. Now, it was a rejection of denominationalism and traditionalism. And to some extent it was. It was an attempt to go back to New Testament Scripture as the only source of authority in, in matters of church, ecclesiology, and to do away with traditions, and to do away with creeds, and to do away with all this stuff that led to all these different denominations. But, what it really was to start with, and this is what most people don't understand, is it was actually to start with, it was a unity movement. It was an ecumenical movement. It wasn't a movement to say, let's go get the true church right. It was a movement to say that we ought to all be able to fellowship together. There shouldn't be 14 different kinds of Presbyterians. There shouldn't be Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians that can't go to church together. And so how can we accomplish that? That's the way the movement started. Now that's not the way it ended up, but that is the way it started. And the goal of that was to try to get unity and organization. And how did they attempt to do that? Well, they went back to the Bible. And they used what has become known as pattern hermeneutics, which is command, example, and necessary inference. To try to figure things out. Now, some people have called that spec. Uh, that, that's a term that I actually picked up from Andrew several years ago, which is sin, promise, example, command, and knowledge. In other words, go to Scripture and looking for those things. That's what you find out of Scripture. So that was the, the method. To try to accomplish what? Unity. And to try to ultimately get back to a true church where everyone could be unified. Now today, some would say we have a true church. It's constantly under attack. And I do kind of believe that. I do. And it is constantly under attack, both from without and within. Part of that's just because of the change of culture and time and, and it is under attack. So what is the true church? The true church of Christ. This is the history that we're going to get at. Some of these points we're going to explore. So non-denominational, autonomous congregations, Trinitarian understanding of God. There are very few churches of Christ anywhere that would take less than a Trinitarian understanding of God. But that is a very evolved concept that developed over 300 years, 400 years, well into the existence of the Catholic Church that we hold to with great, great fervor. I too hold to that. We have a dispensational, sola, only scripture view. And I say dispensational. Dispensational means that different things apply to different times. And so we see the New Testament as the post-apostolic voice of God. And the Holy Spirit. We basically replace the Holy Spirit, or tend to, with the New Testament text. And we use a pattern hermeneutic that throws in the prohibition of silence. In other words, if the Bible doesn't specifically say it, we don't do it. Well, unless we use necessary inference and we can say it's okay. So it's okay to have heating and cooling in a building, but it's certainly not in the Bible, right? Now, what divided the Stone Campbell movement was this issue about prohibition of silence. Whereas some saw things not specifically mentioned at all by the text as a prohibition, others saw it as a liberty. In other words, if it didn't specifically say you can't do it, then it might not be okay. And that is what divided the Stone Campbell movement was this issue over 
How do you deal with the silence of Scripture? How do you deal with things when the scriptural text really itself doesn't deal with those things? Now, from a doctrinal perspective, and we'll try to get into the history of some of this as well, it's the necessity of adult believer immersion and baptism for salvation and specifically for the forgiveness of sin. The observance of the Lord's Supper as a memorial, and there are other ways to observe it other than memorial. There's transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and we'll touch on some of that. On the first day of every week, without exception. And then we might even talk about, well, do we have a little bit of a sacramental view of Lord's Supper? And you know, some might argue we actually kind of do. And I'm going to say this, that's not bad. Non-instrumental worship only. A cappella singing. Now it's okay to have, in fact, we almost need a male song leader. <laughs> and pitch pipes are all right in most places. Song books with notes are okay. And if you, now it depends on the congregation, it's usually okay to have tape music for weddings, and sometimes you might even have real instruments drug into the building for a wedding. Um, and funerals, you know, some places will let you have recorded music. And clapping does tend to be somewhat frowned upon. Now, there's a proper understanding of women's roles. This is a big thing. Of course, they can sing and worship, and they can teach women, girls, and non-baptized boys. Um, there's this concept of the proper name, Church of Christ. If you don't call yourself Church of Christ, you really aren't Church of Christ. That's a more, that's a more recent addition. These are just my personal observations. Oh, and if you are an anti-church, you throw in non-institutional. In other words, you can support an orphan's home as an individual, but it is not acceptable for your congregation to collectively support an orphan's home or any other activity, but you can do that individually. And so the topics that we're going to deal with, how are we going to break this up? We're going to start out talking about the diaspora which is the Jews getting all spread, and the development of the synagogue. Because let me tell you, when you get right down to it, there is a lot of church that's patterned after the synagogue. Yes? Something that was really eye-opening to me. About 15 years ago, we went to Greece. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Isle of Patmos and to the grotto that... that supposedly John lived in yeah. and all that. And they have a church there. Greek Orthodox. Yeah. All right. While he was, we were there, he discussed the primary beliefs of the Greek Orthodox Church. He says, we believe in immersion. He's, we believe in Jesus. We believe, he says, we don't use instruments in our singing. I mean, the basics that he said were exactly what we believe. You know, I mean, he was dressing his little brother yeah. and all that. But the basics... No, Greek, Greek, Greek Orthodox thought and Church of Christ beliefs and thoughts are quite the same. Are quite the same. And he said that the, the um, Catholic Church was a split from Greek Orthodox. Yeah, and we, we, will, we will deal with that. All uh, right, but anyway, it, it was just so that, mind-boggling. That, that, that schism between the Greek, Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church actually started with the Council with the council of Chalcedon in, in 451 when they came to a kind of a conclusion about the, the, the Christ and the Godhead, and that's kind of where the start of the split started because you know, the, the Eastern Orthodox didn't accept that. I'll, I'll stop, but they do have a thing about uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we somehow dropped that, and that is pretty there's, universal anywhere else you go. There's there's a lot of things. So and we'll, we, will touch, we will touch on some of that. Um, so here here's the way I'm going to basically break it down: diaspora, early church, Catholic church, the Reformation movements, the American Reformation reactions and restorations, specifically in that the Stone Campbell movement. And then I'll touch a little bit on where we're at right now today. And maybe where we're going. Or where some people are trying to go. Now, this is a work in progress if there are specific areas that anyone would really like to get deeper in to, to have some more discussion of. 
I want to talk about how the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church is split and the history behind all of that. We can do that in 12 weeks. But we'll, we can touch on just some of the, the big issues there. But I'm open to suggestions as far as where you'd like to go and how much time you'd like to spend. And we finished one week and we have 11 more. And like I say, it's you can only cover so much in 35, 45 minutes in 11 more weeks. So there's a little bit of a limitation there. If you get too far off in the weeds in doctrine, you never really get back to the history. So we're trying to lay out how did we get from point A to point F. And there's a whole lot of other areas in between. So appreciate you coming. Try not to offend anyone. I'm just laying out some of the things that I have seen, I have been exposed to. Uh, and I'm not telling you that's what I believe necessarily or what I don't believe. Like I say, I was born and raised, and I'm still here and don't plan on going anywhere.